All right, long time no video lecture euros. Making up some real estate so that we can begin chapter 21 on Monday because we have a, a tight deadline with uh, chapter 21 and Napoleon test happening next Friday. That's the goal. Could be pushed back, but we're set, let's set our sights on, on, on Friday. The review guide is already up, so you can start looking at it. It's a typical format uh, as usual. All right, on to Napoleon Bonaparte. Bell 2, I was getting ready to finish this with you, talking about the myth surrounding Napoleon's height. One of the big stereotypes about him is that he was short. Well, if you look at it history-wise, he he was 5'7", which at the time was quite average. And if you if you kind of follow this reading uh, with me from historical accounts, um, Napoleon was typically surrounded by his imperial guardsmen. And to be an imperial guardsman, you had to be six feet tall or 1.83 meters. Of course, we here in the United States know how to use meters and metrics. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. And then, so they were already bigger than him. I mean, if he's 5'7", they're six foot. Plus, they would wear great bearskin caps, and that added another, you know, a foot and a half uh, to their height. So they just seemed really, really big in, in comparison to Napoleon. Also, his, his subordinates would give him the nickname Le Petit Corporal, which meant the little corporal. And also, they would call him Le Petit, Le Petit Tendu which meant the little shaved one, because typically, again, he was without facial hair. Um, and so this also added to a confusion about height, because if you're a non-French speaker, petite, you hear it, and you think that that just means little or small. But in the way that they're using it in French, it's more, it's an, actually an affectionate term for someone. So it's like saying, my dear, in the English language. So the dear corporal is what they were saying. So petit ami, um, or petit amie, his boyfriend or girlfriend, so therefore his generals, his soldiers, they would call Napoleon Le Petit Corporal, where Petit was used to refer to their affection towards him, but not for him being small. So there you go. Napoleon was not too short. Short today, but not then. All right. Here is in central Paris. This is next to the Ritz Hotel. So if you're looking at this image, that building there, that's the Ritz, the famous Ritz Hotel in Paris. But this tower or column, I should say, is Napoleon's column, which commemorates his most impressive victory. Do you know what was Napoleon's biggest victory? So there you go. Look it up. I'm not going to give you the answer. Um, if you can give it to me on Monday, bonus point. Well, I'll give you a purple sticker, but it'll show me that you watched the video. A lot of you are, are, are slacking and you don't, you're not watching these. So it, and if you look, start, so Napoleon's at the top. The column itself tells the story of the battle. So from top to bottom, you can actually read the story uh, of the battle. That's what the column's purpose is. Here is Napoleon accepting the surrender of the Prussians. There's another hint for you. All right, the Prussians and the Austrians admitting defeat. Where? What was the battle? You can tell it to me. I think 1805 is the year the battle took place. So look it up. Tell me. Now, France is going to create quite an empire during, during uh, Napoleon's reign. It's going to challenge the British, it's going to challenge the Austrian Habsburg Empire. It's going, to, it's going to start to tiptoe towards Russia, and it is definitely going to hurt the Kingdom of Prussia and unification of Germany. Uh, Napoleon's reign is going to cause the Germans and the Italians as well. Not, they're going to have to wait longer for unification. All right, this slide, you don't need to write anything down. Guys, he was, Napoleon was brilliant, but besides you know, at a young age, rising up through the military, he was an astute military leader. One of the biggest things that he utilized is he fought only when he had the advantage. So if he did not have the troop advantage, Napoleon uh, would more likely than not um, live to fight another day. So he would not put his army in harm's way in terms of most likely an imminent defeat. Now, there is one time when he does he does go against a force that's bigger than his, and surprisingly, well, not surprisingly, he loses, but it's sort of, I guess, prophetic that this battle is the last Napoleon will ever fight. So I bet you know which one that is, where he was outnumbered, but he still fought. Um, some trees. So early on, as he's building his empire, he doesn't resort to harsh measures. Um, if he's able to defeat an opponent or threaten them enough, he tries to use diplomacy. Uh, to gain territory and to still keep agreements with these countries instead of just going and destroying them, crushing them, and, you know, kind of spitting on their ashes. He 
he tries to work with them politically. The Treaty of Luneville is where Austria will accept territorial losses after 1801. They are defeated. The Treaty of Amiens is where the British and French will try to set a peace agreement because, again, they're the two big rivals um, in Europe. And France also gains control of most of Holland. They control um, Austrian regions that, uh, of the Netherlandic area. And they also get some control in the northern parts of the Italian peninsula. All right, and that marked the end of the Second Coalition. As you'll read uh, in, that note, in, the, in the section on Napoleon and then in early chapter 21, you're going to read about all these coalitions and these alliances that are being formed to try to combat against the French, but mostly to try to stop Napoleon. And so it, you, you really, you know, we always have to focus on the balance of power. Napoleon is really tipping the scale and other European powers are, they acknowledge this, they're concerned, and so they're going to try to do whatever they can to get the balance back. You don't want one country uh, to be the most dominant, and France is on that path. So notice, diplomacy now versus just using all-out war uh, to get what he wants. And there's Sleeping Napoleon Kitty. That'd be a good name for a cat, Napoleon. I might... We're thinking, we have a stray cat kind of wandering around the neighborhood. I don't know. I've, I've got to talk Monica into taking it in. It's a... She kind of is allergic to cats, not a big fan. She's more of a dog. We'll see. Martin needs a friend. Uh, the third coalition, and that, that replaces the second. This is an alliance between Britain, Austria, Russia, and Sweden. I'll look to Swedes. Ikea coming back in. And they are going to face off against the French. What's interesting is Napoleon is going to see the map of Germany begun, uh, redrawn to his liking. So all the German states, he's going to acquire most of them. The only one that he is not able to is Prussia, because again, Prussia has the strong military force. But some Germanic states, Napoleon is going to is going to acquire, and this angers the Prussians. It also angers the Russians because he's getting closer and closer and closer to them. Right? Russia's always kind of been, you know, they're they're Siberia for a reason. They're they kind of, you know, their size and their location keeps them away from a lot of the riffraff. But now Napoleon is marching closer and closer and closer. All right, terrible joke. And then sad potato, sad, and there's sleeping Napoleon cat again. These are just some important dates. If you want to look at them uh, to write down, they might be helpful in terms of your studying for Napoleon, uh, but really they're just talking about his rise to power um, and then some of the big things that he accomplishes, the code of laws, and very important, uh, the Cocker Dot of 1801, that's his agreement with the Pope. And there's a zoomed in version, a little bit better for you so that you can see, uh, and then there's his rise to power over here, 1804, he becomes emperor. Uh, d this is not Napoleon, um, but his lineage is actually alive to see the completion of what Napoleon had in store for Paris. He wanted to see four big arches um, that, would be, that would be at the north, south, east, and western entrances into the supposed city center of Paris, um, a la Rome. Uh, the Roman Empire had these massive arches, and the Roman Empire, um, returning home, would march through them, celebrating their victories, and the arches, of course, were dedicated to whomever led those battles and the stories behind uh, those as well. Napoleon wanted many arches. He was only able to commission one to be built while he was living. He didn't even see it completed. Uh, the Arc de Triomphe, in Paris, would not be finished until 1836, so he was dead, sadly. Poor Napoleon. But that's the Arc de Triomphe. Napoleon's all over that arch, too. It's pretty cool. He also tra transformed, uh, he wanted this to be a temple dedicated to his military, the Grande Armée, uh, but instead, the La Madeleine is, uh, is today a temple of glory. So it's, it's, a, it's a temple, uh, but it has no connection or any reference to Napoleon or the Grand Armée today. Here's the inside of it. Pretty epic. Pretty cool. Never been inside of it, but this is a stock photo. Looks looks very neat. All the times I've been to Paris, never been there. Um, now, what is Napoleon? So we said the the Napoleonic Code is his greatest achievement, but what does he want to be his greatest achievement? He wants it to be his continental system, the empire that he's creating, all right? He's going to create his grand armée, a force that is that really had never been seen at that time, the size of an army, and he wants to begin to acquire territory. He wants to expand France so that it is the empire of Europe and soon maybe the empire of the world. And how is he going to do that? What's he going to do? How is he going to make this the new Roman Empire? Well, he's got to challenge Britain. 
have to challenge Russia, and he's also going to have to be mindful of Prussia. He's going to focus on the core. That's where you expand France from its borders to satellite kingdoms. So when you acquire territories, you're going to, you know, you're, you're, you're not just focusing on the area right around you. You're looking at places outside, perhaps, of continent, continental Europe. And then you have to make allies. You have to see if you can somehow get people on your side. And that's why those treaties have been important. You know, even if the treaty is overwhelmingly favoring France, it's at least showing that Napoleon is willing to work with these people or he knows that he needs them when it comes to trade or to just keep the peace in Europe. And so you want to have your allies, in this case, Austria, Prussia, and Russia, will sort of be, I mean, I'm not, they're, they're not besties by any, by any stretch of the imagination, but they are willing to work with Napoleon and he to work with them. Now, the continental system itself, that's focused more on Britain. It's a, it, the goal is to weaken Britain's economy, and also by doing so hurt their military. Now, how are you going to do that? If you go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the British military, I mean, their navy, which is so expansive, you're probably not going to win. Right? They, they are gigantic. But if you're strategic, maybe by hurting their economy, you can end up weakening their empire. So he blocks all trade between continental Europe and Britain. So if I am Russia and I want to trade goods with Britain, I'm not allowed to because Napoleon is going to force me to agree to this continental system. And if I don't, uh, you know, I could face the wrath of his army. So I don't want to do that. And I want to still be able to have trade with other people who are loyal to Napoleon. So the continental system was seen to try to weaken, try to, or try to weaken Great Britain. The, what's the outcome of this? He is not able to destroy Britain. He's not able to destroy their empire. He can weaken it in some ways, but what's it gonna do? It's gonna cause nationalism all across Europe. All these territories that Napoleon is gaining for France or that he is ticking off because he is con sort of controlling their behaviors, what they're doing is they're becoming more and more, one, anti-French, but they also are becoming more nationalistic about who they are as people. You know, the, the Prussian people and the Germanic states are going to become more and more united by being German. The Russians united. The, the, Baltic, the, the Baltic states are going to start to see that they are a homogeneous group of people, too, that are Slavic and they want to be united. So you're just, and the Italians are gonna are gonna be unified. So all of this is just kind of, uh, I guess a uh, a result of what Napoleon is doing. Well, I, I said core earlier, and I just think of the the insanity workouts. You all ever heard of those or P90X? Those type of insane, really you know, hardcore 30, 60, or 90 minute workouts. I used to do those. I really like the insanity ones with Sean T. It's like a Marine guy. They were really good. I need to get back into it. I want to get. I'm gonna get fat just being a dad all the time, so I gotta, I gotta keep in shape, man. There we go. Now, Lord Nelson, famous, famous admiral in the in the British military, he goes toe to toe um, in a battle against Napoleon, a uh, naval battle, uh, and on October 21st, 1805, Lord Nelson is able to lead a defeat um, of a French fleet, but in so doing, he suffers a mortal wound where he takes a um, he takes a, a bullet and unfortunately uh, well, the wound will end up being fatal for him. All right, so that's where I'll stop. We'll finish Napoleon. We got to finish him quickly on Monday and then we will hop right into chapter 21. So um, I doubtful. I don't think I'm going to record another video to, to make you watch uh, two over the weekend. So we'll stop here, but make sure um, days one and two of your reading guide are due for chapter 21, and we're going to get right into uh, finishing Napoleon and then moving into chapter 21 on Monday. So have a good weekend, y'all. Napoleon always. Vive la France. You know I can't end without music. Can you name it though? Can you name the tune? Another purple sticker point.